Let's begin reading in verse 18. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily. Their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. But Isaiah is very bold, and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel, he saith, all day long have I stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham and of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Wot ye not what the scripture saith of Elias? how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they've killed thy prophets. Dig down thine altars, and I'm left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so, then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then is it no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. All right, brethren, let's go to Romans chapter 11. I mean, uh, Romans chapter 10, I'm sorry. The title of the message is, Hath God Cast Away His People? Hath God Cast Away His People? That's the question that the Apostle Paul's answering for us here. Now, after the apostle declared how that God gives faith through preaching, how he gives faith through the preaching of the gospel by the preacher that he has sent, after he declared that, Paul says in verse 18, But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth and their words into the ends of the world. Now this question seems to come out of place or seems to be out of place to me. When I read this, it does not go with what came before it. It doesn't read smoothly. But Paul often begins a subject and then he digresses and he explains the subject, explains something about what he said, and then he circles back around to what he originally started with and picks up with it. And that's what's happening here. I'm, I'm pretty certain of that. And I want to show you, go back to Romans 9. Romans 9. When Paul was declaring how he longed for his brethren according to the flesh, those natural Israelites, he, he longed for them to be saved. Paul called them kinsmen according to the flesh. They were not his spiritual kinsmen. Uh, they were not his fellow brethren in Christ. They were yet in unbelief. But he prayed that he hoped that there were some there that were the elect of God and God would call them. But to make certain that we understand that the word of God did not fail, he says this in verse 6, Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect. It's not as though the word of God returned to him void. Yes, there's a multitude in Israel did not believe, but it's not as though the word of God returned void to him. God said, my word that goes forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void. It shall accomplish the thing whereunto I sent it. It shall. So no, the word didn't return void. Well, what's the reason then? He says in verse 6, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. 
Not everybody in that physical nation are the spiritual Israel of God. That's clear, isn't it? That's clear. Not everybody who was in that physical, political nation are the Israel of God, the spiritual Israel of God. Verse 7, Neither because they're the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. It's not fleshly children who are, are God's children. It's those God promised in covenant promise, he promised Christ before the foundation of the world that all those that Christ redeemed, God would send forth the Holy Spirit, regenerate them to life, and bring them to faith in Christ. And those are the ones that God counts as his children. Those are. Not everybody that's a natural son of Abraham is his children. Those of the promise. Those God promised. Those God produced. Those are the true children. So, it's not as though the word of God had taken an effect. Now go back to Romans 10, 18. But I say, have they not heard? Yeah, verily, their sound, the gospel, went into all the earth, and their words into the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? Did not Israel know that they're not all Israel which are of Israel? Did not Israel know that they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God? Did they not know that the children of God's everlasting covenant are a children called out from Jew and Gentile? Did they not know that God has some elect among the Gentiles as well as among Israel? He said, Moses said to them, Moses told them this, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people and by a foolish nation will I anger you. Now here's my first point. The word of God does not return void to God because God gives his preachers that he sends boldness to speak the truth. That's one reason it does not return void. God gives his preachers boldness to speak the truth. He said, he said did not Israel know? And you know, that's a rhetorical question. Yeah, they knew. They heard this. They were that excuse. They heard that God had an elect people among the Gentiles. He said, Verse 19, first Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation will I anger you. The children of Israel had heard the word of God. How shall they preach unless, how shall they hear without a preacher, and how shall they preach unless they be sent? God sent Moses to them, and Moses declared this to them. They had heard. They heard Moses declare exactly what God said. God said, I will provoke you to jealousy with a foolish nation, with a foolish people, I'm going to provoke you to jealousy when I call them out. God sent prophet after prophet to them. And then God sent Isaiah. And look at verse 20. But Isaiah is very bold. You see, that means Moses was bold too. But Isaiah was very bold. That means both of these men were bold. But, but Isaiah was very bold because look what he said. He saith, I was, God said, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel, he saith, all day long I've stretched forth my hands to a disobedient and gainsaying people. You see, Isaiah was bold in that he declared the truth when he knew it was going to anger Israel. Because he not only told them that God had elect among the Gentiles, Isaiah told them, and not all of you are his elect. That's what this amounted to. He said, God also said, I'm stretching forth my hands to you, and you're a disobedient and gainsaying people. That would anger the Israelites. But he declared it anyway. He declared it anyway. That's true meekness, brethren. That's true meekness. True meekness is not this, you know, acting all humble before men and all that stuff. That's not true. True meekness is being more fearful of offending God than you are of offending men so that you will speak the truth rather than take the offense out of the cross. That's true meekness. That's why Moses was called the meekest man on the earth. That's why Isaiah here is said to be very bold. They both went 
and spoke the truth of God, even when it meant they were going to anger the people and be rejected by them. That's boldness. That's what God's messenger sent to do. That's what he sent to do. And that's one of the reasons the word of God never returns void. It never does. Israel knew this. They knew this. Now secondly, I want you to see the offense of the gospel in what these men declared. God said that he would make his elect from the Gentiles find him. Here's his elect among the Gentiles, and he said, they're going to find me. Look at what he said. He said, I was found of them that sought me not. They're not seeking, and they found me. He said, I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. They're not asking after me, and I've manifest myself to them. But then here's this people who... God had given every privilege that could possibly be given, every advantage that could be given. His prophets after prophet after prophet, he gave them his law, he gave them all the oracles of God, he stretched out his hands, he opened his arms to them, meaning he didn't, he didn't do anything to prevent them to come, from coming to him. Meaning he left them to their natural will to show us what man in his natural state will do. And there he was. What did they do? They disobeyed the gospel. And they gainsayed God. They spoke against God and against the gospel. It's one thing to reject the gospel. It's another thing to speak against God and to speak against the gospel. And that's what they did. So here you have a people that wasn't seeking him and God made them to find him. And here you have a people who... They were seeking, but they were seeking a righteousness by the works of their hands. But they did have all the oracles of God and all these things that God had gave, given them much light. And yet left to themselves. They disobeyed God and gainsaid God. Brethren, that's exactly how God saved us. That's exactly, you and I were these disobedient and gainsaying people. We, we disobeyed the gospel for years. Not only that, we gainsayed God. We spoke against the gospel and against the, against the uh, God. And yet, when we weren't seeking him, we weren't seeking him. And he made us find him. We weren't asking after him and he manifests himself to us. Preacher, how do you know I wasn't seeking him? Because the scripture says in Romans 3.10, as it's written, there's none that understandeth, there's none that seeketh after God. <laughs> you wasn't seeking him. I know you wasn't. I wasn't either. And yet God made us to find him. God made us to find him. Thank God for grace. But do you see why that's offensive? It declares the difference is the difference God alone makes. The difference is the difference the grace of God makes. We're no different. Those Gentiles that God called out of, out of darkness, we've read about them over in Ephesians 2. They, they didn't know God. They were worshiping dumb idols. Idols that couldn't speak or move or do anything. They were calling those things God able to save. How dumb can you get to, to, to worship a, an inanimate object and think you're going to get something from that? We were no different. We are no different. And yet, God chose his people freely. Christ redeemed us by his blood. God did everything to make it just for him to call us out and give us faith. And then God did it. Simply by his grace, he made the difference. He made the difference. That's the offense of the cross. That's the offense of the cross. That's, that's what you just don't hear men stand up and preach. They just won't preach it. They just won't declare that. Why? They don't have that boldness God gives his preachers. Unless a man's sent, he does not have that boldness. Boldness is just preaching the truth. Boldness is, it doesn't matter about how loud you speak or how, how well you speak or any of that. That's not what boldness is. We ought to be able to speak well. We ought to try to present logical arguments and, and make it clear as we can make it. We ought to do that. That's not what boldness is. Boldness is just declaring the truth. 
That's boldness. So the, we see the offense here. God makes the difference. Now thirdly, God's grace is keeping grace. He never loses one that He's chosen. He never loses one of His people. Now look at Romans 11 verse 1. I say then. See God, He started back there in Romans 9 saying it's not as though the Word of God has taken none effect. And he said, Israel heard the gospel. They heard it. They heard it preached. They heard it from Moses. They heard it from Isaiah. And they, they, God opened his arms to them. They disobeyed. They disobeyed God. And so now he's going to say this. Has God cast away his people? What then? Has God cast away his people, his Israel? God forbid. Paul says, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin, God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. There's the qualifier that shows you who his people are. There's the qualifier that shows you what Israel we're talking about here. This is who his people are. This is who God's Israel is. It's those he foreordained to eternal life. It's those that he ordained before the foundation of the world to send the Spirit unto and give life and bring the faith in Christ and deliver into glory. Those he foreordained to eternal life. That's who his people are. That's who his people are. It's not as though the word of God had taken none effect for they're not all God's Israel which are of Israel. Neither because they're natural children of Abraham are they all children of God. Paul says here, he says, I'm an example. I'm a natural citizen of Israel, but I'm more than that. I'm one God foreknew. That's what made the difference. I'm a natural son of Abraham, but he was more than that. He was one God foreknew. And that's who made the difference. That's who made the difference. Had God cast away his people, God forbid. God never casts away his people. He chose us by grace. He redeemed us by grace. He calls us by grace. And therefore, nothing you do can change that. He didn't choose you because of anything in you. Therefore, nothing in you can cause him to forsake you. You understand that? That's... That's grace. And so, this is so in every generation. In every generation. Paul gives an illustration from the past. Look here in verse 2. What ye not, what the scripture says of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they've killed thy prophets, and dig down thine altars, and I'm left alone, and they seek my life. And what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself. I've chosen to myself. I've ordained to myself. I've foreknown unto myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. It looked bad in Elijah's day. It was, it was bad. It was bad. I mean, it gotten so bad in Elijah's day, they had torn down the churches. They tore down the altar. Every place where God where God said he'd meet with his people, they tore it down and set up false places. That's bad. That's bad. Imagine if in this country you got to a point one day when they went around and, and said, tear the church buildings down. They can't meet anymore. It got to that point when in Elijah's day it could get to that point again. And so Elijah prayed, and he prayed against Israel. He thought he's the only one left. And God said, no, 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 no. I've reserved 7,000 to myself. I've got 7,000 elect chosen people here. Christ is their surety. They can't perish. My justice is at stake. My honor is at stake. My glory is at stake. They can't perish. I won't let them perish, God said. I've reserved them. I've reserved them. Aren't you, don't that sound good to be a reserved people, a people reserved by God? And so the same's true in the present. That was true in the past, the same's true in the present. He says, verse 5, even so at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. 
at this present time, Paul said, that present time in which he lived, in that natural, physical Israel, there was a remnant that God had reserved to himself. There was a remnant God had chosen, and a remnant that Christ had redeemed, a remnant that must be called out by the Spirit of God. A remnant. Brethren, at this present time right now, right now, in this world, there is a remnant. There is a remnant. They have been chosen. God foreknew them. They must be called out. That's why this whole world's held in store. Peter said he's not willing that any of those, his people which he foreknew, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. They're going to be brought to faith in Christ. That, that speaks of those Christ died for because he satisfied justice. And now to let them perish would be to pour out justice twice and God won't do that. So they've got to be brought to faith in Christ. They've got to be brought to repentance. And they shall. He's not willing. Now fourthly, so you see they, they're kept by grace. God does not lose any of his people. Now fourthly, fourthly, salvation is all of grace. It's all of grace. Salvation is all of grace. No works are involved in the salvation of God's people. Alright, listen. Verse 6. And if by grace, then it's no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it's no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Now listen carefully to what this means. It's impossible to be chosen of God by grace and by works. It's impossible. Either God the Father chose His people by grace without any cause in His people, or He chose His people because God foresaw something in them. It's either one or the other. One or the other. Which is it? Even so then at this present time also there's a remnant according to the election of grace. What's that? Go back to Romans 9. Verse 10. When Rebekah had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand not of works, but of him that calleth. Not of works. You see that? Not of works. That's why God elected the people to show us it's not of works. It's of God that calleth. It's of God that calleth. It's impossible for God's people to be made righteous by grace and by works. It's impossible. If it's of grace, it's no more works. If it's of works, it's no more grace. It's impossible for God's people to be made the righteousness of God by grace and by works. It's an impossibility. Either Christ Jesus by himself purged his people of all our sins and made us righteous, or his people must keep the whole law of God ourselves. It's not, it can't be both. It's not a mixture. It's one or the other. Which is it? What does the scripture say? Isaiah 63 3 says, I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me. <laughs> That's what Christ said. What he accomplished by it? When Christ had by himself purged our sins, he sat down at the, uh, at the right hand of the majesty on high. Christ did it all by himself. It's by grace. It's impossible for a sinner to be regenerated and called to faith in Christ by grace and by works. It's an impossibility. Either we're born again and given faith and made willing entirely of the Spirit of God or it's all of our works. Which is it? It's one or the other. What does Scripture say? Scripture says in John 1, those people that believed on Christ were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. That's how they were born. 
For he's not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he's a Jew which is one inwardly. Circumcision is of the heart, regeneration of the heart in spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. God did it. Men didn't do it. God did it. Well, how do they, how are you, well, yeah, but, but the Spirit of God regenerates you, but now then it's your will to either accept Him or reject Him. Christ said, No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me. Draw him. That's the only way. What does that word draw mean? If I go down there and I grab Chris, Kristen by the hand and I pull her like this to myself, that's what that word means. No man can come to Christ unless Christ draw, unless the Father draw them to Christ. He gets the glory for that. He gets the glory. Well, well but, 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 but okay, he draws us, but then my confession, that's of me. My confession, I confess to Christ, that's, that's of me. Wherefore I give you to understand, no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus a curse, and no man can say, that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Nope, your confession is of the Holy Spirit too. It's all of God. It's all of God. Every bit. Well, my faith though, but now my believing, that's, that's, that's of me. God who is rich in mercy for His great love wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sin, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace are you saved. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourself, it's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Preacher, you're making me think this thing's not of works. That I can't be born again and come to Christ and believe on Christ and confess Christ by my will and my work. Listen carefully. Titus 3, 5. Let's see if we can get this. Okay, listen. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior that being justified by His grace we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. You got it. It's all of if it's of grace, works have nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with it. All right, fifthly, here's the conclusion. It's not as though the Word of God has taken none effect. It's not that way at all. Verse 7. What then? Israel, that is natural Israel, physical Israel, that Israel, that part of Israel that God left to their own depraved will to seek a righteousness by their own works, by the law, that part of Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for. But the election, those God chose freely without a cause, those that Christ made righteous, those that the Spirit of God gave life and faith, but the election hath obtained righteousness, and the rest were blinded. Go back to Romans 9, let me show you. Romans 9 verse 30. What shall we say then that the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith? They attained it by believing on Christ. That's all they did. God given faith and they believed on Christ. But Israel, that natural part, that non-elect part, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to a law of righteousness. Wherefore? Why didn't they? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone, Christ Jesus. As it's written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock of offense, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Do you get what he's saying, brethren? The... the, the the Israel after the flesh hath not attained which he seeketh for. They were seeking. They heard. Oh yeah, they heard. But they weren't a people God foreknew. He left them to themselves. 
And so they sought, they did what every depraved will will do. They sought righteousness by the works of their own hand. That's what they did. But that elect part, that part God foreknew, His elect among them, they did obtain righteousness because God did everything by grace to bring them to obtain the righteousness of Christ. Sinner, you believe on Christ. You trust Christ. Don't faith is bringing nothing to Christ. Faith is coming to Christ as nothing but a sinner and casting all your care on Him and trusting He alone is going to be everything you need to come to God's presence, be accepted of God. And faith comes to Him and relies entirely upon Him. And through faith, now faith doesn't give it to us, God gives it to us, Christ worked it out, but through faith, just like, a, just like water going through a hose, faith is the hose. And, and God imputes righteousness to us through faith and accounts the righteousness of Christ to us through faith because Christ made us righteous. You get that? And so that's how you obtain righteousness. And God receives us and delights in us. And He'll never cast us off. And the rest, God Himself blinded. We'll look at that more next time. I want to show you, I do want to show you one thing in closing. Go over to uh, Romans 11 and look here in verse, uh, verse, uh, verse, verse 20, 30, 30, 30. As ye in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief, See, because Israel didn't believe, God turned to the Gentiles and called out and they received mercy. And he says, As you in time past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. God said he's going to use you now who believe to preach the gospel to his elect in Israel and call them out. So they receive mercy. So here's my point, brethren. Remember, remember, there was a time you didn't believe. There was a time you didn't believe. And it was through somebody that God had called and shown mercy to that you were made to be given mercy through the gospel. And remember that when you're preaching to an unbeliever because he can't make himself believe. He can't make himself bow to Christ and believe these things. He can't do it. Don't get frustrated with him. Don't get angry with him. Don't, don't get loud and boisterous with him. Just preach the truth to him. He can't do anything but what he's doing until God gives him grace. But it just might be, if you preach the gospel in love, it just might be that God will use you to give him mercy. And you'll find out that's one of God's lost elect sheep. So as you in time past have not believed, but through their unbelief you receive mercy, now you, through your mercy, God's going to make them who don't believe receive mercy. So be merciful. God makes His people merciful. Everything's of mercy. That makes us merciful. All right. After we uh, sing a closing hymn, uh,